Assalamu alaikum jamian. Um, we're very happy today to be introducing Dr. Muhammad Al Hamid, who is the Director of Center of Health Intelligence at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. He um, works with clinical and operational leaders to build and deploy high quality applied health artificial intelligence solutions for enhancing quality of care, streamlining workflow operations and improving patient experience using best practice operational and responsible AI pipelines. We know that this topic is extremely uh, hot at the moment. I think currently with uh, a lot of talk about AI and how it can be implemented in uh, different sectors, but especially within the healthcare center. I think um, a lot of people are um, worried actually about the future of AI. So I think this is the perfect time to talk about the pros and cons of it. Um, I think there's also a lot of um, misinformation, let's say, and poor understanding maybe from, from people who don't have a background in, in informatics or in um, artificial intelligence. And so I think this is the perfect time to be introducing you, Dr. and we're very, very happy. I have to mention in front of everyone how um, easy it was to, to, to book this appointment with you and how um, flexible you were and accommodating to the schedules you were. So I, I thank you again and again for just being so gracious um, with us, and it is at my absolute honor to be introducing you today. And um, we hope this will be a great, fruitful talk, and that we get a lot of uh, questions um, and open discussions, so that everybody can benefit as much as they can. And thank you again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lina, uh, and thank you, Dr. Noor. Uh, it's uh, my honor, actually, and I'm uh, very pleased to be. Uh, invited uh, to give this talk uh, with King Saud University. Um, it's been really uh, an interesting topic to discuss when it comes to AI and healthcare, and um, it is really an open platform for everyone to discuss the future of AI, how it should be implemented within the clinical process, and what kind of outcomes that we are aiming for, uh, aiming for uh, in the healthcare in Saudi Arabia and. Uh, to be compliant with uh, the Vision 2030 as well. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Hamad Al Hamad. Uh, I'm the director for the Center of Healthcare and Intelligence. Uh, previously, I worked as machine learning technical lead uh, in IBM Rochester's and worked for Toronto Lab, uh, R&D Lab of IBM in in Canada. Uh, I was also uh, the chairperson of the Department of Health at King Saud University, so I'm familiar with King Saud University. Uh, I used to be assistant professors and associate professors uh, a couple of years ago. Um, just to give uh, some brief about the King Faisal Specialist Hospital, uh, probably most of you already know uh, King Faisal is a tertiary care hospitals with 45 uh, plus years of helping patients uh, to overcome uh, severe challenges, health care challenges, including the focus on uh, five uh, disciplines, the cardiovascular diseases, the neurological diseases, uh, the oncology and hematology, uh, organ transplant and genetics uh, and inherited diseases. Um, the hospitals until um, last year helped one point eight million uh, outpatient visits. Uh, the hospital has more than 15,000 employees. Uh, we have the new giant uh, hospital that's being built in Jeddah. We have a new uh, mega project for expanding the Jeddah hospitals to be one of the biggest hospitals in the region. Um, the presentation that I'm going to take you through uh, is going to cover a few aspects. So we're going to start with the healthcare technology. Uh, how data really plays the important role of helping the clinicians to do their work in a more efficient and effective way. Uh, why we are really care about AI and why it has uh, AI to do with uh, humanizing data and what do we mean by that? Building the blocks of applied healthcare when it comes to AI. Uh, the majority of the work is in the research field, but how we can move to application from research into the clinical process or to the clinical environment. Uh, we're gonna talk about our use cases, uh, how we apply AI within the hospitals, operational, uh, clinical care, uh, and uh, the uh, enhancing the experience of the patient staff, et cetera. 
And finally, we're going to discuss collaboration opportunities where we believe that collaboration is the best way to work and build up an ecosystem where researchers, uh, clinicians, and uh, engineers uh, has to come up. Uh, they have to come up with um, a collaborative ecosystem where they can exchange ideas and build things uh, together. All right, so um, probably you have heard about the fourth industrial revolution uh, and uh, how AI and machine learning is really playing the, the most important role when it comes to uh, transforming uh, different kinds of industries, uh, including uh, healthcare. Uh, it is very uh, predicted that the uh, fifth uh, generations that's coming up, the fifth, fifth industrial revolutions, is going to come uh, in one decade or two maximum in comparison with the time it took us as humans to go from the first generation where machines introduced to the second uh, um, uh, the uh, generation where uh, the revolution was among using the electricity and enhancing the efficiency of the mechanics and the machine that was developed in the previous, in the 18th centuries. And the third uh, revolution was about the automation and building the robotics when it comes to manufacturing different kinds of objects. But the fourth industrial revolution that we currently live in uh, is completely accelerating the loss of technologies when it comes, for example, the autonomous vehicles, uh, the ability to have uh, intelligent agents that we can chat with, like the chat GPT, et cetera. And um, it's very, very important to- Dr. Uh, Mohammed, uh, can we just make the screen full screen just to make sure. it clear for everyone? Thank you so much. No worries, thank you. I can hide this maybe if I can as well. Um, so uh, probably most of you maybe knows the um, the movie Terminators, which is a really an interesting movie where uh, the machines that was developed by human uh, conquer the humanity and uh, overcome the control of, of the planet that we live in. Uh, but that's really just an imagination where the power of artificial intelligence and robotics uh, cannot be controlled in a way that those machines can learn for themselves and overcomes what they have been designed to do. Uh, but this is not the reality. The reality is the healthcare becomes more managing, uh, kind of managing information and the ability to transform data at the right time for the right context, for the right people. And uh, the three important things is how we can um, bring up knowledge, quality, and technology uh, to work up uh, together in a way that help the physicians to do uh, their daily uh, routines in a way, in a better way and an efficient uh, mechanism. Uh, we do have a loss of technology. We have wearable electronics. We have the machine learning predictive and advanced analytics. We do have the 3D, the 3D printing today. But what we are missing is we how we can build up uh, those kind of machines in a way that really uh, evolution the, the healthcare in a way that's really different from the typical healthcare process that we practice today. Um, so when it comes to data, um, data is all about the sources of information that lead to building a loss of technologies. So data to us is the capital, is the investment, um, a medium that we have to capitalize on. Uh, the data has a lot of ingredients. It's coming up from a different kind of digital products. It's coming up from different kinds of services. It's coming up from a different modality. So the most important in order to really build up the infrastructure is the ability to have a full integrated, uh, very well wired uh, systems that has high interoperabilities and the ability to transform a small data coming up from different kinds of machines or small system into a lake of data where the um, data can be integrated for a different kind of application and for different size sake of uh, outcomes. So what the patient information here uh, represented in the middle as a small cube, uh, it's actually the reality because patients, they are, interacting with the world, that is also full of information. So for example, um, 
during the COVID uh, era, the government has initiated a lot of vaccination process or uh, programs. Those kind of vaccination affected the patient. It's affected, for example, uh, uh, the prevention and the ability of patient to overcome the virus of corona. And similarly, can we uh, anticipate what kind of uh, programs we can uh, develop together in order to prevent, for example, breast cancer's uh, ability to uh, overcome some kind of uh, severe uh, diseases that tailor toward the community, tailor toward the patients uh, that we uh, we accept on a daily basis. And if we can take the biggest pictures, we have the Ministry of Health, we have uh, the uh, genealogy, the different kind of uh, information related to the environmental um, aspects, uh, the ability to uh, collect as much information that help us to really uh, picturize what is the patient is going through and what kind of environment they live in. And when it comes to health uh, continuum, it's uh, the ability to uh, push the uh, healthcare interactions from the later stages uh, to the early stages. Uh, so the question for all of us is that once we get born and to this life, uh, how many physicians we deal with until we become adults? And when once we become adults, how many physicians we are dealing with until we uh, reach out to the midlife uh, ages and until we uh, face the, la the latest uh, stages of our age, uh, how many physicians are we dealing with? So uh, the statistic obviously says that uh, the more we, uh, seniors we are, uh, the, uh, the likelihood that we are dealing with more patients, sort of more physicians and more uh, clinical providers, different clinical providers, and each one of those kind of clinical providers, they tackle different kind of problems. So we need to push for preventive medicine, definitely. We need to push for personalized medicine. We need to push for quality focused care. And that's why uh, data and AI can help to really accelerate the process of being able to uh, cover the patient throughout their life journey. So the data that we are talking uh, about is comes into the datums where uh, it used to be just 80 uh, meg or so uh, that represent a single patient throughout the year. So one patient, um, their data could be fit in um, a small uh, USB uh, uh, storage stick where the data today is completely looks differently than what we have been dealing with uh, in the last decade. Uh, if you remember the floppy disks that's in the 80s and the 90, early 90s uh, was only 1.4 megabytes. And the amount of storage uh, that you can carry using your phone is coming up, you know, whether it's the iCloud you know, on the iPhone or the Google Drive on, on your Google devices. Uh, they have the ability to store uh, hundreds of gigabytes um, in, in only a few minutes. And if we consider uh, the expected growth, the annual expected growth of data uh, and businesses related to data by 35%, then we are talking about storing at least uh, 1.5 gigabytes to represent one single human gene uh, for a single patient. So that's a huge amount of data that's probably very um, difficult to uh, store, manipulate, and process. So we see that there is an increased number of, uh, increase in the, the amount of storage that needed to process single patient data in comparison with the ability to process the data in efficient time. So, um, so we've been talking about data in a different way. Uh, then what's exactly the data that we can store today about the patients? Uh, definitely, uh, we do have a lot of databases. Uh, they call them today EMR, Electronic Medical Records. Uh, they um, mainly the healthcare has two big companies, uh, Cerner and and Epic, uh, but more um, different, more ERB systems and more EMR systems are being created today. Uh, to bring up some kind of uh, different kind of views regarding the databases that holds the patient data. And we have uh, the uh, different kind of modality that represent the radiology data. It's kind of, if it's a CT scan, uh, MR, MRI, um, X-rays, et cetera, mammography. And each one of those kind of modality is being saved in, in a different format, usually in a DICOM format where the 3D representation uh, of the scan is being saved where every single slice of the data is a huge 
uh, by itself to represent a two-dimensional representation of the, of the view of what the scan uh, is seeing in the patient. And um, what is very important to mention here is that um, there is a different kind of format. There is a structured data, the unstructured data, and uh, the semi-structured data that comes up in a different uh, standards. So we, today we do have a lot of standards, uh, which is really great, but uh, we are also lacking uh, many more needed standards specifically for radiology when it comes to AI and, and when it comes to our ability to store uh, metadata, uh, predictive data, and, uh, and capturing the feedback uh, from the artificial intelligence models. Uh, it's very interesting that when it comes to research uh, and the ability to really uh, understand how uh, the data can be represented. Um, we as humans, we only understand data in a two-dimensional way. It's very difficult for our brains to capture and visualize data in a 3D dimensions. So this is really um, makes it very difficult to, when we analyze the data with physicians, with clinicians in general, um, they, um, they needed time to really capture how um, we can see the patient, the single patient in the flow of, of different kinds of diagrams and the flow of different kinds of dimensions. So imagine this is just two features uh, that are being represented in two dimensional array. Uh, we, uh, dealing with the different use cases, we realize that it's not about the dimensions, it's not about representing the histogram, the amount of patients. Uh, suffering from a different diseases or, or uh, being labeled with a specific diagnosis, it is very important to really segment them into different areas. So you can see, for example, the areas in here is way smaller than the areas in here uh, is smaller than the area at the top corner where they share a lot of uh, features together. The commonality between them is uh, is larger than the commonality between those kind of dots that lives in a smaller uh, square. And what's really interesting is that uh, we took a few dimensions and we were uh, thinking, can we anticipate what's, um, what the patient looked like without really seeing the data? So we're kind of like mimicking some kind of uh, interesting aspect about the patient without even reading the data itself. So there is something called generative adversarial networks where we kind of generate data artificially without any kind of relying on any actual data. And we compare uh, the uh, reality versus what the AI model thinks about the data. So you can see, for example, the uh, green, uh, sorry, the blue and the orange uh, curves represent the artificials versus the actual data that's represented by uh, the databases. And you can see, for example, uh, although the model have not seen the pictures of the data, but they understand the generalizations where the patient in general, they share a certain kind of dimensions uh, worldwide in comparison with the patient that we see facility. And um, in order to really bring up AI uh, back to tertiary care uh, and uh, bringing an integration mechanism of AI within the delivery and operational side of, of healthcare, uh, we see a loss of opportunity. And this is uh, a call for everyone who's interested in AI to look into uh, those kind of dimensions um, uh, closely and see what kind of complex cases we cannot really deal with today where AI can really bring up uh, patterns and, uh, and leverage different kind of dimensions that is beyond what we can observe as humans and help us to understand uh, why this is a complex case, uh, why uh, we know a bit, very little information about this kind of diseases and how can we overcome those kind of challenges. And it's very important to put the patient in the centers because um, the most impactful AI are, are those AI that really impact the patient uh, closely, uh, whether they uh, improve their experience, uh, engage them while they are at home, uh, provide two way of communication, for example, like chat GPT, you ask questions, you uh, receive responses and uh, bring up a discussion where um, those kind of discussion usually is much easier for patient to talk to a machine than to talk to a real person, to a real physician, specifically for really um, some, some certain uh, diseases where people might be shy to share what they feel about them. 
there are operational side uh, when it comes, for example, the drugs availability, the supply, um, the operations, uh, the utilization, etc. We're going to come out uh, touch on uh, some of those kind of uh, use cases. So how can AI help in healthcare? So there are lots and lots of dimensions, uh, whether it's we can start with the diagnosis, uh, we, the preventive care, the prognostic use cases, uh, also for medical research where uh, medical genetics and uh, the genetics uh, serialization and sequencing can benefit from AI. Uh, AI definitely has shown a lot, a lot of potential when it comes to medical imaging. It's actually very anticipated that AI would be uh, contributing the most uh, in, in the radiology domain. Uh, emergency, surgery, infection control, nutrition, uh, virtual assistant, these are just uh, domains of uh, very critical domains where AI has, uh, has shown some kind of potentials already. All right, so our understanding of AI in King Faisal Specialist Hospital was very crucial to, in order to really bring up any kind of centers uh, dedicated for AI. So we came up uh, with a lot of um, governance uh, teams sitting together in order to understand uh, how we can assess AI and how can we identify the use cases that we should be prioritizing in order to uh, build up something uh, quickly and has the most important impact. So we came up with uh, three dimensions that uh, we thought we need to focus on, uh, the operation sides, the care quality, and the experience. We uh, thought that any AI use cases has to contribute to one of those kind of dimensions. And in order to really assess any kind of use cases, um, someone has an idea where AI might uh, they think might be very helpful to solve their problems, then we came up with uh, this kind of triangle where uh, we wanted to assess the value and the feasibility of every single use case. And every single use case uh, was uh, measured against uh, their uh, scalability. So is the value of this use case is high, medium or low? Is the feasibility of this kind of use case based on the availability and the quality of the data is high, medium or low? And we identify a lot of potentials uh, for every single uh, dimension. So for example, the highest uh, value with the highest feasibility according to what we have seen in the data is anything that comes with the patient experience, patient specific recommendation or personalized medicines and, uh, and so on. And moving forward, uh, we, uh, those kind of dimensions, operation care quality and experience is being categorized in a more, um, detailed way where operation can be categorized as monitoring AI models, automating, automation or automating AI models, uh, the optimization aspects, uh, where the aim, the healthcare aim is efficiency. We want to be efficient and we want those kind of AI use cases to be really contributing to that. When it comes to care quality, we identify the three dimensions. Uh, we, uh, we want a couple of use cases that help us to increase the ability to do preventive care, uh, the ability to do diagnostics, uh, AI models, and the ability to really uh, do a prognostics uh, models, for example, like the lung fibrosis. When it comes to experience, uh, we want AI to uh, be embedded with our virtual care experience, the hospital experience for physicians and staff in general, the precision education where uh, the residents uh, and the physician are being tailored toward a, a specific content and specific domains where based on um, uh, their growth uh, in terms of the operation they do, the perform, et cetera, we can recommend some certain uh, paths for them. And uh, after we kind of like identify the dimensions, identify the overall uh, layout, we came up with five pillars that we need to work on in, in the center. So uh, we had to do a lot of policies in order to increase the governance of using AI in the hospitals. We had to modernize the infrastructure. So this is very key important things is that do we have the right infrastructure to process this huge amount of data to operate the machine learning models efficiently and to uh, operate uh, the predictions and the classifications and all the uh, types of outcomes coming up from those 
from those kind of models all the way back to the MR or the uh, healthcare uh, systems. We have to invest on the human power. So we have to make sure that the data scientists, the engineers are exposed to the domain of healthcare. They have the ability and the understanding of the different kinds of modalities when it comes, for example, to radiology, to the diseases, the diagnosis, coding, et cetera. And the ability to really contribute back to the clinicians who we are working with. So we uh, were able to um, uh, create and establish the first programs in Applied AI uh, for clinicians. Uh, this is the first program being certified by the Saudi Commission for Health Sciences. And then uh, the, the final aspect is the collaboration, the ability to uh, the ability to really create the ecosystem where people can collaborate uh, with. It. So we are working with King Saud Universities. We're working with Prince Noura, Princess Noura University, uh, working closely with MIT as well. Uh, Harvard Medical Schools uh, represented by the Mount Auburn Hospital, etc., to work closely on on building some kind of use cases together. Um, we we do have uh, the technology. We have data. We do have. Uh, artificial intelligence machine learning today, but it's very important to bring up the attention that this is all has to come after having a very well structured digital infrastructure. The digital uh, digitizing the healthcare is very, very essential. So for example, um, in King Faisal Specialist Hospital, the first uh, EMR systems was established in the 90s. So we do have two decades of data, of patient data that's being uh, collectively uh, stored and maintained throughout the, the last two decades. And uh, this kind of digitalization help us a lot to really build up the foundation to build up uh, artificial intelligence in, in real time. And for those really interested to, um, to say, if I want to increase my capacity as a hospital when it comes to artificial intelligence, these are all the domains that we pay attention to when it comes for real time, uh, capturing the continuous ability to learn where the model is not only being trained once, but they have the ability to continuous learning and, uh, uh, and uh, evolves uh, over time and increase their accuracy and ability to, and sensitivity as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, machine learning, there is two capabilities that we have to pay attention to. The predictive capabilities where the model says, I'm predicting this kind of diagnosis. I'm predicting this kind of uh, risk for this kind of patient, but also the ability to prescribe what kind of action that has to be taken. So the prescriptive piece is really very important, but it's also challenging. Um, so just, I'm gonna touch on a couple of use cases just to share what we have done so far. Uh, in, in the hospital. So the first use case that we decided to work on is the ability to really capture everything that the patient goes through uh, because the patient's already receiving the uh, satisfaction surveys. The, the surveys usually provided by third party like breast scanning uh, right after their visit to the hospitals. And they complain, for example, about the loss of dimensions. They have uh, having very little knowledge about uh, the treatment plan, having very little knowledge about the side effect, specifically uh, with oncology patients, uh, where they have to go through uh, continuous sessions of chemo or radiation therapy. And they share a lot of information through the social media, whether it's Twitter and Facebook. And these share a lot of concerns, they share a lot of uh, information that really help us to pain point, to, to point the pain point uh, causes of a lot of concern that came up from, from the patients. And what we did is that we built up this kind of uh, system called ANFAL. Uh, the ANFAL system is basically, we want to observe every dimension about their experience, about the patient experience. And we build up a systems uh, where we predict before the patient come up to the, to the clinics, what exactly uh, their ability to understand the therapy side effects, what every single uh, patient ability 
to be able to hold or handle long waiting time? What's the ability for every single patient to be comfortable during the therapy? What the ability of those kind of patients uh, uh, to observe um, different kinds of staff behavior, et cetera. So this has helped our nursing uh, uh, staff to really understand and deal with different patients in a different way. So this is, was not really personal medicine, but it's very important to touch on the patient experience. This kind of understanding led to a huge number of use cases that we're going to cover in a quick manner, but uh, it, Sharing and fall was just to share that it has to start from the patient. We have to put the patient in the centers and all the technology that we have today, all the ability that we can come up with artificial intelligence machine learning, they have to contribute back to the patient. The patient have to feel that something is being done about their data, something is being taken care of in the offline mode where uh, everything is prepared just be before they arrive to the hospital. Uh, so we started with uh, the scheduling of OR. The operating room today was manually uh, monitored where the uh, scheduling teams uh, on a daily basis, they um, try to understand uh, the orders and estimate based on simple mean statistics, uh, what's how much uh, time uh, this kind of surgery would require um, the surgeon to go over uh, the completion of, of the orders for that surgery. So every single order that comes with the primary procedures, uh, some of those kind of uh, orders come up with secondary procedure at the same time. Uh, there is a specific anesthology requirement. The anesthologist usually have a certain requirement for those kind of patients. And uh, some recommendations come up from the anesthetologist to require uh, an ICU bed as well. So um, the ICU bed was very crucial uh, and it's unfortunately leading to a loss of cancellations. So we analyzed all the primary procedure, the secondary procedures, the modifiers, who's gonna be the surgeon, who's gonna be the anesthetologist. And uh, we kind of like leverage those information to provide every single surgery. And instead of just relying on the mean of every single surgery, we wanted to profile every single surgery in a predictive manner. So there is an AI model that predicts for every single order, how much time you need, we need to book the operating room for. So in order to really increase the utilizations and, increase, and decreasing the cancellation risks. And instead of waiting for the confirmation for the ICU bed to arrive in the morning of the surgeries, we kind of like uh, build up a model that really analyzes all the patient's uh, situation and diagnoses in the ICU. And we're predicting the length of stay for those kinds of patients. And when we link uh, the predictive models of ICU length of stay with the OR uh, uh, utilization predictive models, we started analyzing that it's very uh, easy to really book the, the surgery that needed an ICU bed on the days we think it has the highest availability. Um, another uh, use cases is a heart center. Heart center is one of the uh, most important center in the hospitals, uh, whether for transplant or for um, the different kind of uh, treatment that the patient provide uh, to, to their patients. Length of stay is the uh, one of the highest when it comes to um, the heart center patients in comparison with other patients for other departments. And we decided that we want to analyze the data and uh, understand why certain patients, for example, stay beyond the uh, benchmark, which is around seven days uh, for, um, for, uh, for every single patient. And the interesting uh, aspect was that it was very easy to predict uh, for certain patients uh, what exactly uh, the likelihood that a uh, certain patient will be staying less than four days or between one or two days or beyond seven days benchmark. And it really highlighted um, the potential risk of every single patient uh, going or staying in the hospitals. And uh, it linked the expected operational intelligence with the um, expected outcomes when it comes to the clinical aspects. So um, usually that's less to the admission. So for example, uh, we try to understand, can we highlight those kind of patients whom we think their readmission risk is very high 
based on a lot of factors, including the laboratory results, the diagnosis, the echo signal that's being collected over time. And then we can detect whether this kind of patients um, would very likely be admitted within 30 days or within 60 days. And uh, the prescriptive part that I was mentioning is that, uh, which we are working on, is that once we identify those kind of patients, what kind of actions or prescript, uh, prescriptive actions the clinicians or the physicians they have to go through in order to prevent any kind of free admission for that type of patient. Um, uh, rare diseases is one of the key um, uh, important KPIs to tackle from the Ministry of Health. Uh, a lot of those kind of diseases uh, are basically uh, being dealt with the primary clinicians uh, or primary care facilities. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the referrals come very late to uh, the hospitals or to the tertiary care uh, hospitals like uh, National Guard, King Basil, etc. And what we wanted to do is, can we just build up uh, smartphone applications where the uh, we don't need uh, to do a lot of medical genetic sequencing. Uh, we can just take a pictures of the patients, um, understand what kind of diseases that might be uh, inherited already through, um, uh, through uh, the previous generations. And, uh, and the goal was just to make the, the right referrals at the right times. Uh, so we started with MPS syndromes. Uh, this is a very well-known syndromes, very rare in the Saudi, but uh, you find a lot of uh, patients in the Eastern province where uh, this, the, some organs, specifically the, the facial features being uh, growing in a faster rhythm in comparison with the other feature, with the other organs of the body. Uh, another use case is the tumor. Uh, the biophysicist on a, a single case, they spend uh, between uh, uh, four to five business days in order to control uh, one patient. So uh, imagine a patient with a brain tumor. You're going to wait one week uh, for the biophysicist to complete the profiling of the tumor in order to uh, set up this case ready for the radiation colleges to decide the amount, compare the amount of uh, doses that has to be uh, uh, treated uh, for the patient. That process today is uh, absolutely uh, way behind uh, what technology can provide us. If the technology today uh, uh, has the ability to let the vehicle to drive itself, uh, then we should be doing something. So we use computer vision uh, models to contour, to automate the contouring process. So the biophysicists, instead of doing the manual work, their work is, uh, is being transformed into verifying what the model thinks, the 3D modeling of the tumor in the brain. And uh, uh, their uh, job was uh, reduced from spending four to five business days into just spending maximum one business day to verify the outcomes of the models. Uh, no show is one of the typical use cases. Uh, I'm not gonna really go into deep uh, details in here. Uh, but when it comes to organ transplant, uh, one of the key uh, processes or steps is to really segment uh, those organs in, in a fast way. Uh, so uh, whether it's renal, uh, liver, uh, et cetera, we, lungs, et cetera, we have to make sure that we calculate the volume in a very accurate way. What's interesting about the, this use case is that uh, the, the way the radiologists uh, segment the kidney, for example, uh, is by relying on the total volume calculations. In comparison, we wanted to do more uh, accurate uh, calculation of the volume, so we rely not on the total volumes, but on the cortex volume calculations. And the accuracy was much higher in, in comparison with the total volumes that is manually being done which indicates that when we profile the patients and their uh, applicability to uh, donate the liver to, to the recipient, then uh, you, wanted the, you wanted really the, the most accurate information to be available before making that decision. Breast cancer is one of the really uh, critical use cases for us, uh, touches, uh, actually it touches all of us. I can't tell, I cannot really remember uh, discussing this use case without receiving some kind of feedback that one uh, of our family member is being diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, 
So it touches us, uh, touches our family, etc. Uh, what we wanted to do is not doing a diagnosis, but we wanted to do uh, an AI models that do a lot of preventive care. Uh, we found uh, a lot of use cases is being diagnosis is way uh, very late uh, uh, yeah. level three or four where it could have been uh, uh, have been picked up way earlier and uh, has uh, it could have been uh, going through a lot of uh, more frequent scanning in comparison with completely. Uh, forgetting a uh, number of years that could have been impacting the treatment plan. So what uh, we are working uh, on this use case with MIT, um, the uh, use case is to predict uh, the likelihood that this patient with a single mammography scan, what the likelihood that they will develop cancer for the next year, for the next five years, sorry. And uh, if the risk is very high, we cluster those kind of patients uh, depending on their period level, predictive level, and then we recommend some kind of scanning. So this is right now is under validation. It's not really uh, on pilot yet, uh, but we're really receiving a lot of positive feedback from the consultant that we are working with. Uh, Prioritizing x-rays uh, on a daily basis uh, across the three hospitals for Riyadh, Jiddu, and Medina. We are taking almost uh, 100 and more x-rays per day. Uh, imagine um, the radiologists to go through those kind of x-rays one by one. What we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that uh, we prioritize those kind of uh, abnormal chest x-rays immediately. So we are flagging those kind of x-rays using AI, where we uh, wanted the radiologist to pay attention to those kind of cases ahead of all the other use cases that we have in the pipeline. Uh, lung cancer risks is another really, uh, very critical oncology use case. We wanted to make sure that we are using the low dose uh, scans to estimate the likelihood of building cancer uh, for lungs. However, uh, we are trying to really uh, make sure that this is aligned with uh, a lot of factors, whether the patient is being uh, a smoker, um, they have uh, inherited disease, uh, common diseases, etc. And what we want to do is just we want to kind of look at the profile, as, as I mentioned previously, that preventive care is really crucial. Uh, lung fire process is another really interesting use case. It's very excited. We are very excited to really see the outcomes that should be coming up soon. Uh, the uh, the fire process uh, develops in a different uh, patterns. It, it has a different kind of behavior from one patient to the others. But what, what we wanted to do is we want to make sure that um, we anticipate, we predict what's the likelihood that fire process in this patient will be um, much faster than the five processes being seen with other patients. And using just uh, computer visions, we were able to really um, show uh, for the next scan, what's the likelihood that the five process will be spreading. And uh, we've provided that, we quantified that value uh, with that scan into a single value. Uh, I know I'm over time, uh, but I just want to uh, highlight the, the most critical use cases that could uh, open up uh, everyone's eyes to um, uh, to uh, to think about how AI could be embedded in healthcare process. And finally, I just want to take the opportunity to invite everyone to attend our conference that's coming up next week on the 16th and the 17th of May. Uh, we do have. Uh, uh, lots of international speakers. Uh, one of the uh, best speakers worldwide from May Clinic, from Harvard Medical School, from IBM, uh, and from University of Minnesota, etc. So uh, this is the QR code uh, if you are interested to register. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for giving me the opportunity and for uh, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, so much. And um, we had a great turnout today. Um, I want to thank as well Prof. Al Malki, Prof. Athman Fedda for attending as well. I know this is a, an extremely um, interesting topic for, for many of us, whether junior starting in our um, beginning of our career or more senior. Um, and I want to open maybe the floor for any questions. I know a lot of people want to also maybe ask some practical questions about 
possible usage of AI in uh, research as well, because uh, we do have a lot of researchers in the audience. Um, but I know we have also a lot of people working within the operational sector, the research sector, and then the clinical sector, and each one or each uh, group would kind of look at it of how they can use it from their own level and their own perspective. So I am opening the floor for questions, if we have anything, but I want to thank you for this great, great talk. It was very useful. Thank you so much for taking the time to put it together. Um, we really appreciate it. Okay. So do you have any comments or questions from the audience? Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. معكم دكتور مجاهد عطيف طبيب أسرة. I'm really thankful for this great presentation and for the great speaker, Dr. Muhammad Al-Hamad. I just have a couple of questions. The number one is regarding the cases that have been discussed, the case of no shows, because many of us are working in outpatient setting. So we want to know what exactly happened in in that case scenario. Uh, the other questions, what are the other probable application of um, of um, AI in out patient setting, especially in primary care? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mujahid. Uh, yeah, sorry, I did not really go into the de deep details of that use case, but uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so the no-show is typically... Uh, it's been always uh, looked at as a statistical uh, kind of uh, use case where uh, we kind of like predict the statistics and identify, uh, produce the, the, the patient's uh, no-show uh, by either uh, trying to call them manually or uh, try to remind them, etc. cetera. Um, as a tertiary care, it's very difficult to call every single patient. The, the amount of patient we see on a daily basis is huge. As what we wanted to be is we wanted to be efficient. Uh, so uh, we built up this kind of AI models that analyzes the behavior of patients, specifically, for example, their locations, uh, their age, uh, uh, whom they come up with usually, um, how frequently they come up to the hospital, um, what exactly the diagnosis that they have been uh, going through, what are the prescription that they have been prescribed with. Uh, and uh, merging all this kind of data, we kind of, we were able to identify the high risk patient that will not show up into their appointment. Uh, and it was very obvious that uh, it's very clear, for example, to see some clinicians are really suffering from a high no-show, for example, the, like the nutrition clinics, et cetera. And what we wanted to do is that those kind of high risk patients go through a specific programs. So we have built up a center. Uh, the center is dedicated for um, uh, calling those kind of high-risk patients. So instead of calling everyone, we call only those we think they might not be able to show. Uh, and uh, the calls are basically trying to accommodate their needs. So for example, um, uh, usually patient coming up outside Riyadh, they have to take a flight, the flight might be delayed, et cetera. So, by having that conversation, they might be able to fit up the patient into different time slots, or they be able to uh, reschedule the patient to a better timing and uh, a better uh, layout. Um, uh, plus the automation part, where uh, we send a reminder for every single patient. Uh, definitely, that really helps. Uh, that's beyond AI, but uh, basically, the, we found it the the calls having a call centers calling those kind of patients with a high likelihood of not showing up was very efficient. So we were able to reduce the nurture um, in a different department. So it was between seven to 10%. Although that percentage is only uh, very small to what we anticipated, we were anticipating 20% or more. Uh, but that 10% uh, generated uh, 500,000 revenue per week for the missing opportunity of providing care to the patients. So uh, it was actually turns from a being a no-show use case into a use case that really has influence on the revenue generations of the hospital. Regarding the second questions uh, regarding the outpatients, uh, actually the outpatient um, clinics are one of the key um, uh, 
the key clinics that we really wanted to do a lot of uh, improvement, a lot of innovation, let's say, when it comes to uh, using uh, AI. Um, we haven't really uh, put too much investment, uh, just to be honest with you. Uh, the reason is uh, we want to make sure that um, we cover the uh, operational side more than the clinical side. So I would say on the uh, on the outpatient, we were able to predict the um, the volume of the patient coming uh, showing up into the emergency. Uh, we were able to build up a model to estimate the number of prescriptions per hour for every single pharmacy. So for example, we do have uh, five pharmacies within the hospital, within only uh, Riyadh. So for every single pharmacy, because we know the uh, the uh, appointment ahead of time already. We know uh, what have been what the patient had been prescribed already. We were able to tell the pharmacist uh, that this amount of prescriptions and this is amount of uh, medicine is very likely will be required at this hour at 11 a.m. for example on Sunday May 9th and uh, sorry on on Tuesday May 9th and uh, that would help us a lot. Uh, to decrease the amount of waiting time uh, for patients in the pharmacy. So I would say for all outpatients, uh, we were focusing on the operational intelligence, uh, estimating the prescription, estimating the number of patients in the ER, uh, estimating uh, also improving the, um, uh, the uh, experience, the patient experience, as I mentioned with MPAL, uh, and also estimating the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Got the last uh, use case, but it's more like uh, uh, the uh, the number of labs, the number of orders uh, that uh, would be required by the hospital. So we help uh, our laboratory to prepare uh, how many labs would be very likely would be arriving at the uh, at every single lab uh, stations ahead of of, of time. Thank you so much. I think you have a few questions in the chat um, as well. Um, what about the infrastructure needed? Do we need specialized data center platforms? Maybe you can speak about what we currently have within the Saudi infrastructure for data. Yeah, that's really an interesting question. So the infrastructure is very key. So I, I remember, uh, when I came up working for the hospital, we didn't really have a GPU. Any kind of biology or medical imaging AI model. And we have to really completely ask for new infrastructures, GPU enabled, et cetera. And what is very important is that the data has to have a pipeline. So uh, having a pipeline is very crucial. So what do we mean by pipeline is that how, how frequently you pull the data out of your AMR systems, how you categorize those kind of data, how you clean them up. So the cleaning is very crucial and how you uh, drive those kind of data into every single pipeline, whether you are estimating no show, whether you're estimating, for example, the likelihood that uh, how many prescription will be, uh, will be coming up to the pharmacy in the hospital, et cetera. And then uh, part of the pipeline is that you record the inference, you record the prediction, uh, because you wanted to, to monitor the, the behavior of the AI model itself. So you don't want any kind of questions or uh, unexpected behavior of the models. That, that would really affect the trust that the clinicians provide to, to the AI models. So we, uh, in terms of infrastructure, definitely the computing infrastructure has to be upgraded. The data infrastructures, you have, we have to have the right databases. Uh, we had to, for example, to use NoSQL databases and structured database in order to fulfill uh, natural language processing uh, ability, et cetera. Um, and the ability to have a machine learning operation infrastructures. What do we mean by that is the ability to deploy models, monitor the model performance, and also visualize the performance of the models because our executive are really uh, um, concerned about what exactly the AI model is predicting, what kind of output is it, they, it's producing and what kind of uh, outcomes we are receiving by using those kind of models. So I would say those kind of three uh, dimensions are very important in any infrastructure. 
we currently don't have that, do we, as like a national based type of infrastructure where we get all the data from different institutions? Or is that something that you hope to see in the future? Yeah, I, I do. I do have. A, a, I do share the same concerns that uh, we basically share very little with, among each mm. other. Um, I know this Daya, for example, they are working on lots of initiatives when it comes to um, sharing data, etc. But uh, I think it's we are doing the the first, uh, let's say, baby steps, but we we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I think that's that's usually the frustration we keep hearing from everyone that that even tries to to do um, just a small scale um, research just to kind of get their hands on a little bit of data from different institutions. So I really hope that the future we can kind of build this one thing. But do you think that we will worry about it? As in, I feel like in other countries, there's always this worry about um, you know protection of of individual data. Do you see that also as a concern for maybe? The patients or even individuals within our community? I, I would definitely share the, the same concerns. Um, there are lots of um, uh, privacy rules uh, as well that prevent us from sharing data. So for example, uh, just to be honest, uh, we, uh, we consider today uh, the printing names, the printer names uh, is a private information that we should not be exposed uh, beyond, uh, for example, the uh, the territory of, of, of the country, uh, because we uh, Saudi is is one of the targeted countries when it comes to uh, at, uh, cyber attacks, etc. We understand that we need to be protective. Uh, that's why the cyber uh, security uh, authority and uh, along with Sadia might have a lot of regulations related to what type of data we can share, what type of information we do. But I believe uh, what we, in terms of technology, uh, the technology enable us to uh, really analyze the data in, in a few, in a matter of few seconds today. And it tells uh, us whether this information is sensitive or not, and what kind of uh, BII or personal identifiable information uh, the data holds. So I believe the technology will contribute into this part. And I, I see it will be changed. The, the way that we do share data will be changed um, extremely um, aggressive in, in the, the next few years. Uh, specifically, for example, um, the federated learning. Uh, this is an interesting topic for anyone interested is how we can train up the model without sharing the data. So I believe that's something that we will be witnessing soon. That's very interesting. If he, Dr. Hamdi has his hand up. Sadal. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Hamdi. Um, I will introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm coming from medical background. Uh, I've studied uh, epidemiology and medical statistics and science for four years. I'm working in um, uh, application of AI in healthcare. Uh, uh, in Netherlands. So um, uh, I'm really abroad with this uh, progression and this level of uh, awareness about AI in um, uh, an Arabic country such as Saudi Arabia. And I'm really optimistic about AI. Um, and I will, uh, I will agree about um, that uh, prediction is very important in healthcare. Uh, I have a remark about uh, my vision for AI uh, intervention uh, in the uh, health sector. I believe and I see uh, researchers here in Netherlands working in what's called central intelligence of diagnosis. What that mean? That mean that uh, after I don't know if it's months or years because it's the development in AI is very, very fast. Even one week means like uh, six months in other sector of development. It's, it's so fast. So um, in, in the soon, it will be like uh, this central uh, intelligence of diagnosis. Uh, a lot of data are collected in central algorithm. Uh, and you can uh, use um, you can uh, get help uh, in diagnosis of your cases as a, a doctor as, or as a, a hospital from this uh, uh, huge, huge model. Uh, and that's uh, especially developed by what's called multimodal 
models which can deal with a lot of different types of data like image data, wave data, uh, numerical data, uh, and voice data can deal with a lot of different types, which is typical uh, to the healthcare because in the diagnosis moment, we should make decision based on image, on waves, on numerical data, a lot of data, even text data. Uh, we can, uh, so these multimodal mo uh, models are very, very, uh, 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 have very potential for healthcare. Um, so um, I believe that soon, within within few years, will be this such huge uh, intelligence for diagnosis, and that will make a diagnosis uh, accessible for all um, uh, health specialists in the world. Uh, so I have a question: What should countries like our countries in Arabic area do? What what our uh, niche? to intervene in this uh, revolution. I think these huge models also lack the ability to be more specialized and more specific to our population. So if there is this uh, uh, big algorithm that can diagnose uh, a lot of diseases and uh, a lot of doctors underestimate this, but this will happen. This will happen just like ChatGPT3. So we should, make our data, our plans, our policies to uh, adapt with this revolution and be ready to make our models that specialize to diagnose diseases in our population. I'm speaking about diagnosis because I believe this is the first uh, uh, field on domain of medicine that will be invaded by AI because it's just a classification problem from a data science view. So it will be uh, the first part that will be um, uh, changed. Uh, can I have one, one uh, uh, prediction of my, uh, my prediction, personal prediction is um, I predict within years, I don't know how, how many, but that the way of uh, training and education in the medical field will change because if we have this a huge central intelligence for diagnosis, maybe we don't need a lot of people um, uh, in, in, in the hierarchy of medical specialization. Maybe we need someone to enter the data correctly, the medical data, so he, he's a one like uh, a data entry person for medical data that, that trained to uh, record, to examine signs and symptoms and enter it to this algorithm. And then we need another one like a consultant to approve the final diagnosis to, to, to say that that's, that's correct. So this is a huge change uh, in, the, in the healthcare uh, that could be introduced by AI. And I'm really happy with uh, this mind uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, with the vision 2030. I'm so happy to observe that and uh, to uh, like brainstorm what can we do as uh, Arab minds to be part of this revolution. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamdi. I think you touch on a lot of points, really interesting points. Um, uh, to your question, um, what's exactly uh, our focus or what do we do in order to really revolutionize the healthcare system in Saudi? I would um, speak for myself. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the country, but um, I would say uh, from the hospital point of view, uh, our aim is to build upon our local capabilities. This is the main uh, ultimate goal for us. If we are able to build up local capabilities that understand data, that build up AI capability within the hospitals, we will be able to really observe those kind of technologies and help to build up the right diagnoses and preventive and prognostics use cases in a very, very efficient way. Um, I can't um, count how many times we sit down with different kinds of companies or uh, a research institution where they have a model that was built on the data from that specific uh, country for, for certain populations. 
uh, and it turns out that it completely does not work on the population of patients that we see uh, in the country. Um, that was even for uh, simple use cases like radiology, where we think uh, it's all about uh, CT scan, it's all about mammography. It should not really matter that much when it comes to understanding uh, whether there is a certain uh, deep tissues in the breast in comparison with other patients, and that would lead to uh, a cancer possibility. So the reality says differently. That says um, the generalization, the ability to build up an AI models, train on a certain type of population to be generalized worldwide is something not realistic. And I'll give you an example of <clears throat> sepsis. Uh, sepsis was one of the use cases that was very successful with EPIC. Uh, the prediction was very high. Uh, they generalized it to three different hospitals within the Boston area. And unfortunately, the three other hospitals failed to really get the same amount of accuracy. Uh, why is that? Although it's the same state, it's the same healthcare systems, it's just that the, the Generalization aspect is completely difficult and very challenging. That's why, um, back to my point, is that building local capabilities number one is coming to a prioritization. Yes, uh, I will agree about that. Uh, but what also what I'm expecting that there is uh, this general model that we can in the future fine tune. Uh, based on our data, um, this is um, uh, an, uh, another approach that maybe uh, the healthcare we should consider that uh, it's a possible way for to work in healthcare. Um, and uh, uh, I think, yeah, prognosis also is very important. And uh, I I read these uh, articles about sepsis also. Um, I think. Uh, with coming of NLP models like um, ChatGPT3 and uh, uh, the new technology in the AI and new investments in the AI and new models will come and uh, that can exceed, uh, I believe that can exceed an average, um, uh, yeah, an average uh, intelligent uh, precision. Um, so, uh, my view is we should consider that now early, so early. Uh, if, it, if it's happened, uh, we can be a part of it. If it's not happened, uh, we, we take it into consideration. But I'm, I'm really happy to, to hear about uh, AI discussion in healthcare. Um, and I have, an, I have an idea that may be uh, helpful for communicating uh, for data collection uh, and data management in healthcare, like um, uh, chatbot. Chatbot, I believe that, chat, that the last decade was a decade for application apps, but the coming decade is the decade of chatbot. We don't need to communicate with computers uh, in, the law, in the old way. We can communicate with computers in the future in uh, spoken language, in uh, natural language. Uh, so I think the, uh, the old way of data collection data management in healthcare is, is also gonna to change because you can now build a chatbot that collect information from uh, patients about history, about characteristic patients, and also can uh, uh, upload the, this uh, uh, investigations and extract data and uh, merge that all, and also can interact with uh, general models that's available now and make some suggestions for the doctor about diagnosis, suggestions about treatment plan. So this technology is already now available and could be used, and we should think how to integrate it in our healthcare systems. Thanks. Great. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Mohammed um, or comments from the audience? Okay, we'll give it another two minutes. Um, 
Yeah, again, I want to thank you again and again. Um, I really think this is an important topic, even though for, for me personally, I do qualitative research. So it's it's a bit different. I guess I'm <clears throat> more to what people like to make fun of me and tell me I'm into the hippie science, you know, and all about human emotions and dig deeper. But I'm I'm sure the the AI will help us in the future to even start to kind of identify that and analyze that type of data. Um, it'll take the fun away from me, but it is what it is. Um, is there any final words that you would like to leave us with, Dr. Mohammed? Uh, no, thank you so much, everyone, for for attending, and uh, really a pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, I just left the slide on my email, just in case if anyone wants really to reach out. Uh, we're very open and keen to do a lot of collaboration, so uh, uh, hopefully we can build up something together. Um, inshallah. We actually have a collaboration that's. We're in work in progress between us and King Faisal. So hopefully it'll come to light soon. And I'm really excited about it because this way we can we can finally, um, well, hopefully we can share the data. We'll see how that goes, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll collaborate and work together to do research, to do clinical trials, whatever it may be. Um, thank you again for your time. This was very enjoyable. And thanks for everybody for attending. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks.